All right, so good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're all joining us from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And if you're joining us for the first time here in this fantastic Oceans Week celebration, then we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through free, live, interactive broadcasts. I know this has been the strangest year for teachers of all time, so we really appreciate you continuing to join us, showcasing such special people and places from around the world, uh, whether you're live, whether you're full class, whether you're at home and your kids are screen sharing, it's more appreciated than you know, and hopefully this week is a fantastic celebration as we get close to the end of this crazy school year. Now, if you haven't checked out our other Oceans Week presentations on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel, they are all there. So if you want to hear from Boris Worm about sharks or Andrea Reid about indigenous fisheries and more, they're all on our YouTube channel and I really encourage you to check them out. And if you want to see more about the full Oceans Week lineup of incredible events being put together by the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, check out OceanWeekCan.ca. It is your one-stop shop for a whole slew of fantastic resources, information, events, and more. Such an amazing team that has brought this together across Canada, and it's our privilege and pleasure to be a part of it. That was a lot of peas in one sentence. I'll try and continue that throughout the broadcast. Now, for today's program, I'm really excited because we are welcoming in a new speaker. We are joined by the marine detective, Jackie Hildren, who's going to talk to us today about exploring the Northwest Coast waters, some of the most amazing creatures, big and small, that you can find there, and some of her own adventures out in those seas. So, Without further ado, and battling some light computer problems before this keeps us on our toes, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie to blow our minds. Jackie, thank you so, so much for joining us today, and uh, take us away. <laughs> here we go, folks. I am so incredibly excited to be here. Thank you, Jesse. Where am I? I am on the Pacific side of Canada in Kwakwakiwak territory at the very top of a very big island. I am a whale researcher. I am a diver who takes pictures underwater, but I never bother the whales when I'm underwater. They've got enough troubles. They don't need people in with them. And what I really try to do is learn from the ocean and to try to make that count. And I really am a teacher through and through, so I'm so glad to be here. I'm wearing two hats today. I am a whale researcher with the Marine Education and Research Society, and I am a diver who goes by the marine detective trying to learn about the life below the surface in the world of the whales so that people might care more. And yes, when I go diving and take pictures, I wear a green tutu. It's important, you can ask me about that later. So I am so lucky in this small part of beautiful Canada with all its coasts, I know individual whales. So this is KC. We used to whale, whales like KC, even when I was little still. But thank goodness we've changed and now care about them and know how important they are to the ecosystem to make it all work properly. But how do I know this is KC? I can recognize him by his tail. I can recognize him by the fin on his back. I know who his mom was even, because that's what happens when you start paying attention to individual animals. And what I get to know then, is this isn't just a whale. This is a whale who was born in 2002. His mom is Houdini. He's as big as a school bus. He was hit by a boat at least once and he was entangled at least twice, and he goes all the way to Hawaii to breed, and he feeds close to where I live. But I don't know just about the giants. I also get to learn about individual fish. So this one tiger rockfish I have seen in the same place for six years. <laughs> How do I know it's the same tiger rockfish? By her stripes, because they all look a little bit different. How do I know it's a she? Because she's pregnant here. This is one of the kinds of fish that have their babies grow inside and then release into the soupy, rich ocean. And she could live longer than I do. This is the one of the things I've learned. I think a lot of adults don't realize that there's some fish that actually have homes, but also that there's some fish that can be over 100 years old. There's even one kind of rockfish that can be over 200 years old. Urchins, one kind we know can maybe get to be 200 years old too. So why is this all so important? Why as a teacher who really cares about kids, do I focus on the ocean? Well, because we humans, we make mistakes because we don't realize how important the ocean is. 
and certainly the dark ocean that has so much plankton in it, we think like, oh, things are better somewhere in Hawaii where I can see through the water. No. Or you have people who think, well, I live in a desert, so the ocean's not important to me, but that just isn't true. The ocean is making about half the world's oxygen, no matter if you live in a desert. And that's from the green, tiny plant-like life in the ocean, the phytoplankton, up to the huge seaweeds and kelps. It's taking in, the ocean is taking in a lot of carbon dioxide, which is the gas that makes things warmer. And of course, it's the blue planet. Most of the ocean, yeah, most of the water is in the ocean, There's food, and also the ocean somehow makes us feel better, whether it's healing or inspiration. And then another thing I find with adults is so many don't realize that it's the same water since before there was life on Earth, since before there were dinosaurs. We've got water going up, turning into clouds. The ocean is up on top of the mountains as snow. Down it comes. And then what people don't forget, you can be really, really far, what some people forget, is you can be really, really far away from the ocean, do something on land, and it's going to end up in the groundwater and going into the ocean. So no matter where you are right now, you're close to the ocean. And it's such an amazing thing to think. It's the same water that's been going around again and again and again. There is no new water. So also then, so the big challenge is that it is true that so many people think, oh, I went to Hawaii, I went to Mexico. It was so much better than the ocean in Canada because I could see the fishes. Let's think about that. If you can see the fishes, if the water looks like this, that it's so easy to see through, there's not a lot of life in that water, not tiny stuff that can then feed small fishes, that feed big fishes, that feed the giants. So that's a real problem that people think that the ocean's better somewhere else. So how can they take care of things properly right in their own country? So this is the main thing that I do is to try to bring the beauty to the surface. So here's an example. You don't need to know the name of this animal. Just look at how the sunshine is right there. So this is just below the surface. And most people don't even know this animal exists. They think, how can that be here? Well, for goodness sakes, how can we have whales and huge halibut and huge salmon and other fish and not have all kinds of other life? in this soupy, rich, cold, dark ocean. So right below the surface, there's beauty like this. I try to bring it up, taking pictures, so that hopefully people go, oh, that's here? Yeah, that's here. We really need to care more about our ocean because our lives depend on it. And there's so little we know about it and so many mistakes we've made. So just talking, that was a kind of sea slug. Just talking about the sea slugs, look, at the different kinds that are close to the place that I live in Canada. And people think like an animal like this, oh, that's a jelly. No, that's a sea slug. And it's amazing. It gives off a smell like watermelon bubblegum. They collect in the thousands. It's got naked gills on its back. That's why it's a kind of nudibranch. And those things that look like Mickey Mouse ears that let this kind of sea slug smell its way around. It's right there below the surface, and so many people don't even know it exists, and that is a problem. So I'm showing you some snapshots of what the ocean looks like when it's cold and dark. So many people don't realize it's an ocean full of color. This is a camouflaged fish. What? Camouflaged? And they can be orange and yellow and red and white? Yes, camouflaged. Because if everything around you is so colorful, that lets you be camouflaged. That lets you wait until a little crab or a shrimp walks on your head, and then with your big mouth, oh, you can go and eat. This is what our ocean looks like in the cold, in the dark, where there's so much oxygen. It is an ocean full of beauty. Look at this face. And yes, I am saying the word beauty because it's so important to realize there is no ugly in nature. You sometimes get adults who go, oh, look at that, it's strange. Like they say that about an octopus. Like for goodness sakes, it's an octopus. It's supposed to look like an octopus. If you learn to look at our neighbors and think instead, not, oh, it's ugly, but whoa, 
that's interesting. Everything is the way it is for a reason. So why would this fish, and it is an adult male, why would it have such a big head? Why would it look like a rock? And then your brain can start figuring out why it is that way. And this amazing fish that has a bad name, it's called the wolf eel. It's not a wolf and it's also not an eel, but does have this really long tail. And ask me later if you wanna see some video of it. The reason the head is like this, you've probably figured out, probably lives in amongst the rocks. Yeah, that's a good hypothesis. But also by having a big jaw like that, that even has bone at the top, it means you can eat urchins. You can just snap them in half and don't have to worry about the spines going up into your brain. And how could it possibly be that we make judgments that fish like this aren't beautiful when look at how much it looks like a Muppet? It looks exactly like Statler the Muppet. In fact, this one I have nicknamed Statler because he looks so much like this Muppet. This is also an ocean of giant. All the oceans around Canada are an ocean of giants. Look at the look on my friend's face in this picture I took. She's amazed at how big this sea star is. It can be a meter across. And most people don't even know that it exists and they don't know it's in terrible trouble. So this is a sunflower star and there were a whole bunch of kinds of sea stars on the coast that I live that got really, really sick. But because it's happening under the surface, so many people don't know, and then we don't learn, like, hey, maybe this is also something that has to do with us, and it usually is. And it's thought that because the ocean is getting warmer, or there's other things happening with climate change, that things like a virus or a bacteria are now able to make them sicker because the sea stars are stressed out. And that's really important to know, but again, it's hidden away. And it's not just about the sea star because everything of course is this beautiful web that's connected. And the sunflower stars feed on urchins. Urchins job in nature is that they will eat kelp. But if there's too many of them, because there aren't enough of their predators, then we have a problem. So here's a little video show, then it sped up this video showing just how well the urchins can do in eating kelp. So there they go. Yeah, it's sped up, it's their job in nature, but if something gets thrown off for whatever reason, then a kelp forest that's supposed to look like this, there's more urchins, they eat things up and it looks like this. And then you don't have the habitat, the forest for so many living things, there's less oxygen being made and there's less carbon dioxide being taken in. But to go back to happy things then, why are there, I keep on saying, it's an ocean of fragility, it's also an ocean of mystery, it's an ocean full of giants. Why is there so much life? Why do we have the world's biggest sea slug, the world's biggest sea lion, the world's biggest octopus, whales as big as school buses? And the reason is because of plankton. And a lot of adults even don't understand plankton properly. They think it means something small that's drifting in the ocean, but even the huge jellies are plankton, it just means to drift. But some of the plankton is plant-like. So you can see in my picture here how it looks green. So that green or tiny plant-like life, and of course there's these giant plant-like seaweeds and kelps as well. And they're the ones making the oxygen and taking in the carbon dioxide. So that's great, because that's food for so much and they're making oxygen and there's more oxygen in cold water. But there's also animal-like plankton. So things like krill, a lot of people know about krill. It's big enough to see and you can go, oh yeah, that's an animal and it's not gonna be able to go against the current. So it's drifting around, it's plankton. But a lot of people don't realize that the ocean is full and full and full of babies. So here's an example of a baby, a kind of animal in the ocean that the picture here, the video has been made thousands of times bigger. And those little hairs that you're seeing, that's not so it can swim against the ocean pushing against it. It's feeding on something even smaller. But in this soup of the ocean then, what's happening is these babies are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And some of them then sink to the bottom of the ocean. And in the case of this baby, 
it makes its own shell and becomes this beautiful animal. Another example is this has made, been made thousands of times bigger. It's a baby, a larva in the ocean. And what happens with it, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. It drops to the bottom of the ocean, sticks its head to a rock, builds its own shell, and then spends its entire life feeding on plankton with its foot. And I know that some of you figured it out. This is a barnacle baby and specifically for the world's biggest barnacle. And in this video, look at how soupy the ocean looks. So you know what that is now? It's all kinds of small plant-like life and all kinds of babies and also the sex cells that make babies. So here you go. You can see how thick and full of life the ocean is and then if you have a lot of life at the bottom, of course you have giants. So here's a simple picture to show that. Loss of the tiny life means that you can have more of the life above that that's feeding on it. Then you can have more of the life feeding above that and it can then have the giants at the very, very top. And cold water has more oxygen, which is why there is so much plankton, but also the tide makes really big changes in Canada. It gets squeezed through tiny places between islands. The ocean bottom makes it go up and down. So what you get is the food is also getting mixed around through the entire ocean. That is the life in cold seas. And to show you this then, so here you can see, hey, what's going on? The ocean looks green. So that looks like it could be Canada's ocean. Looks really thick. There's birds at the surface trying to get, well, those are small herring. And then there's diving birds trying to get it. Gee, I wonder. So a lot of small life. There's the food web. Yeah, I wonder what'll happen. The murders only attack from beneath, trapping the fish against the surface. But they push the herring within range of the gulls. It's a feeding frenzy. The table is set. I hope you're all going, whoa, but that's how it works. Tiny life that we can't even see. Yeah, so you can have the little fishes and then everything is feeding on them and it can have the giants feeding on them. The humpback whales, for example, that belong here and that the big mystery should be that we don't ask why are they here in Canada's waters, but that we should be asking why would they ever leave to go to warm water because there's little to no food for them. And it's believed to be because they're then trying to get away from the kind of orca whose job in nature is to eat other marine mammals, including humpback babies, for example. So this is Crescent the humpback. I could tell who he was just from looking at his tail in this video. And this is how most of the humpbacks in our area feed. Humpbacks have all kinds of different ways of feeding, depending what kind of food they're trying to go after. And of course, they're only gonna go after huge mouthfuls. And then they have to get rid of the salt water because they're mammals, they can't process salt water. What is so amazing is when you start really watching, you can even find humpbacks that nobody has ever taken a picture of before. Or even with these giants that breathe the very air that we do, you end up finding out that they are doing something that you never expected. So this is Conger the humpback. I've known him for a really, really long time. And what you're looking at here is you're looking right up in the top of Conger's mouth. That's what that pink is. And that's all that baleen coming down that lets the humpbacks get a giant mouthful of food. And then they have the problem that they have to get rid of the salt water. So it gets pushed out from the baleen. And oh, by the way, some of you might be worried about birds ever getting stuck in the mouth of baleen whales. Ask me about that. But what happened here is one day I saw Conger, I was like, what are you 
doing? He's hanging there with his mouth open like this. He's spinning around a little bit. But that's not the way you usually get your food. But what's amazing is that some of the humpbacks here have learned to feed in a completely new way. It started off that we just caught two of them doing it. And now other humpbacks have learned from them. There's at least 27 of the humpbacks that often feed close to where I live that do what we call trap feeding. They're setting a trap. And as long as there's still birds going after the same little fish, same kind of fish, juvenile herring, then the herring might hide in your mouth. Well, thank you very much. I didn't have to use much energy at all. I can just close my mouth. So here's an example of that. You can, this is taken with a drone where you can look down, you can see how corporal the humpback is trap feeding. And you should look to see, hey, those diving birds, are they still here? Because there has to be a reason that the herring are trying to hide. So here you go, corporal trap feeding. Setting the trap, the top of his mouth is up here on the top. You can see the huge wing-like fins of, that's because humpbacks are the only whales that have those, spinning around a little bit. The birds are still, you can see them under the surface. Some little fish are in his mouth and closed. So clever, so amazing. It's amazing how little we know because nobody on earth knows how humpbacks even know the food is there, even when it's a big ball like that. So why is this all so important? I think you know. We have made really bad mistakes. And we usually make mistakes when we have fear instead of knowledge. So for everybody watching now, especially the kids, to you it would be, it's impossible that there used to be a machine gun to kill orca. But that's who we used to be. Because way back, it's actually it's not even way back, it's when I was little, the idea was there's too many orca. They all eat salmon. They're a nuisance. They need to die. And the government was even the ones who put the machine gun in the place. It was never fired. There were other guns used. And I think somebody figured out, like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be using a machine gun because there'll be bullets that might hurt people. But what this shows is, wait, what? There's no way we would ever accept shooting orca. So look at how quickly we can change. And that's because we now have the knowledge to know, because somebody cared enough to tell them apart as individuals, to go, wait a minute, just because you see them often doesn't mean there's a lot. They're the same ones over and over again. They're actually in terrible trouble. There's three different kinds on this coast. They have different languages. They have different jobs in nature. So we can make terrible mistakes about the life in the ocean, also not understanding we're connected to it. So if the world is warming up, that means the ocean's warming up. Or if we're using chemicals on land, that it can end up in the ocean where it gets concentrated in the animals. It's unthinkable now, but we used to shoot like leatherback turtles. And these are turtles that belong on both the Atlantic side of Canada and the Pacific side. They're the world's biggest turtle. They come from far, far, far away because our ocean is so full of life and they can feed on lots of jellies. So we're not these people anymore who thought, wow, that's cool, a leatherback turtle, let's kill it to learn about it. We're not that, we care. We have laws to protect these kinds of animals. We still make really silly mistakes not realizing our connection and this video will show you, there's a camera on the back of the leatherback turtle, and you'll be able to see how thick the ocean is with life. The leatherback is feeding on jellies, but gee, the jellies look like plastic bags or the balloons we let go up into the air. Not thinking about if something can't rot away, there is no away, where is it gonna go? It's gonna end up either small, small, small in the ocean, or even big, where it's the size of a jelly. So we still make these mistakes.
So what an easy problem to solve yeah, is we use less disposables. We don't do things like release balloons that we think about where things go when we don't have them in our hands anymore. And it's so important because the ocean that does all these things that is so important to life on Earth that we know so little about it. Like again, we don't even know how baleen whales find their food. And they're huge and we have studied them for more than 40 years and they breathe the air that we do. But here's another example. This little animal, it's only about this big, lives almost right in front of my house. And it was only in water that was about this deep. And I took a picture of it because I thought it was so beautiful. I was thinking about, gee, why is it the way it is? If it's got these pom-poms at the end, that must be to catch plankton and then put it in the middle to its mouth. But what I found out is that this is a completely new species of a kind of jelly that's called an over, oval anchor jelly, but that it doesn't even have a name yet. And that's just here, like in the shallows. So we need to be careful, but we humans, we're not humble enough very often where we think, oh, we know better, we can fix the problem later. No, we don't know enough. So just to finish this up then, and answer your questions, really, like I'm not, I want you to care about the ocean and know wherever you are, you're connected to it and how much there is to still be discovered and how much when you start watching nature, like in your backyard that you know, oh, that's that bird that I've seen before, the amazing kinds of things that you can learn. But really, people need to care more and know more and not give animals identities to think that they're scary or something to understand they're part of the web of life. So we need to know how important the ocean is, that land and ocean are connected. We need to be careful because there's so much we don't know. And we can help everybody to care more and do more by teaching them more. So how to make a really big difference, not just for the ocean, but for ourselves? It's so simple. Anything we can do to make less waste, by not using things that we throw away all the time, using less bad chemicals that have like the skull and crossbone on the bottle even, and also using less energy and using all kinds of new ways that we have our intelligence using solar energy or other different kinds of ways. And then more learning, more sharing about how amazing this is and helping more people care. So we make less mistakes and it's better for the ocean and better for us. Jackie, that was spectacular. I, you know, I could talk all day about how spectacular it is, but I love these comments coming in the last few seconds we've got. Thank you for being so kind to our ocean, Miss Jackie. Uh, I actually care so much. Thanks so much. Uh, all from students all across Canada and the U.S., uh, well over 350 kids in this broadcast today. So thank you for a really beautiful presentation. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us, we can have a bit of a conversation, please do. Yes. Um, you shared some things that I, I haven't been shared in any of our other broadcasts or Oceans Week that I love. First of all, nudibranchs at the beginning. I know we're all like on whale brain right now. We're all very excited, but like the sea slugs are the most amazing creatures. They're the most beautiful, lovely, amazing animals that no one really thinks about. Um, some of this footage from BBC programs. I mean, I grew up with David Attenborough. The narrator of that program is my, my hero. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen Blue Planet 2, uh, it is the best nature documentary ever made. So if you want to follow up on some really great footage, uh, a really special opportunity. And you showcase these birds diving in, which I have seen off Canada's East Coast before. And it's so amazing to think we have things like that that are right here. Like we don't have to travel around the world. They're right here on our shores. And I, I, that was a beautiful presentation. So thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I want to dive in with questions. We've got a whole bunch of groups in the YouTube chat bar. If you guys want to let me know where you're from, if you haven't already, share questions. We'll take as many as we can. Um, in our live groups, I'll come to you in just a second. But you prompted me, what happens with birds? Are the whales ever eating the birds? Do they ever get trapped in the mouth? Tell me. <laughs> okay, so I, got, I have got to share my screen. Okay, bring and it back. <laughs> bring it back, because I thought I might get asked this question, because I prompted you. Yeah, so <laughs> here we go. So you remember then, yeah, that we have the whale rushing, yeah, getting all that food in its mouth. Yeah. And indeed, so important to realize is that what nature has done to make sure 
that only little stuff can go down into the stomach of a baleen whale is to make sure that the throat is only that wide. Yeah. So what can happen is, I'll never forget the first time that we're waiting for a humpback to come up and bloop, 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 there are three drowned gulls. So it's possible that the birds will drown in the mouth because they can't go down the throat. Here's right. one that can't help at all because it's stuck in the baleen. Here's one that is very, very lucky. So this is Guardian the humpback. See the bird in her mouth? It was flying around. She must have felt it. She opened her mouth. The bird did not get out. Oh. She closed her mouth. She opened it up again. And then the bird decided it was a really, really good time to go. But there's also something else amazing that happens. Look at these little guys. So these are tiny birds that can fit down the throat. Yeah. And then they get pooped out the other side looking like this. And this... The science name for what they are when they get pooped out the other side is bird bricks. So what happens is some of them get stuck, they drown. Some of them are really lucky and can get out if they're a bigger bird. And if you're a tiny bird, probably one feeding on krill, then you get pooped out. Oh, no. <laughs> bird bricks is a very beautiful, elegant name. Um, well, thank you for that. That was unexpected. I've actually never heard that story video before, so I appreciate that personally. Um, let's go to Ms. Dolesglass. They're joining us in Newcastle. If you guys want to come in and unmute your mics to be our first live question, go for it. Ms. First, first of all, thank you so much, Jackie. <clears throat> um, we feel so privileged. It was after every slide, I just was on the edge of my seat, like just incredible photography and video. So thank you so much. Um, as a student is wondering about sea stars and about the number of legs they have. Do they all have the same number of legs and why so many? Yeah, so they absolutely don't all have the same number of legs. We get used to thinking that all sea stars are supposed to have five legs, but even the ones that have, that the species has five legs, just like us, some of them are a little bit different and they can have six legs or four legs. But there's also the six-legged sea star where most of them have six legs. And then there's the one that I showed you, the sunflower star that can have 24 legs. So it depends. And it's one of the, it's such an important thing. Like a lot of people think it's sea star, one kind. On this coast, 30 different kinds or more. So different kinds have different numbers of legs. And part of that is that some of them have different jobs in nature. We had uh, Hugh Griffiths on on June 1st, and he was talking about the Antarctic biodiversity under the ice there. And in some of his footage, there was all these different kinds of sea stars together where you see these different legs in action and in different creatures. It's very, very cool. So Ms. Dole's class, I really encourage you guys to check that out. Um, Mr. Fulber's class, if you guys want to come in, and then we'll head to Miss Dylan in a minute. Mr. Fulber, unmute that mic from St. Anthony. Come on in. Hello. Um, one question came in. I'm afraid we might have missed it. We were having a little bit of light, but what is your favorite animal? Yeah, so I don't have a favorite, and that's really, really true. I I even kind of don't like the favorite because that like the word because it suggests like it belongs to me a little bit. So for me, I really try to keep it where every whale, and I I know some of them exactly who they are, like KC. But for me, it's really important not to have favorites. So I keep on looking at everything, all the whales, all the sea slugs. And I know I know that's a really good question. And if anything, my favorite animal is kids. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are pretty awesome. We've got so many today and the enthusiasm has been tremendous. So I think that's a, a worthwhile answer. Um, thanks, Mr. Fuller. We always get that question, so I appreciate that, that nuanced response, Jackie. Um, let's head to Miss Dillon's class. They're joining us in Farmington, Missouri. If you guys want to come on in, go for it. Yes. Hey, kids, welcome in. Hello, Mrs. Dillon's class. Hi, my name is Guinevere. And my name is Mason. And um, I want to know what you do. And oh, uh, what made you decide to want to learn about all this? Oh, gosh, thank you so much, both of you. So I used to have a very different job. I used to be a teacher in a classroom and I was actually like a principal person. And I lived in Holland, in the Netherlands. And what made me decide to do this is I went, when I came back to Canada visiting, my friends took me out on a whale watching trip from this little, little place. And what that made me realize is, oh my goodness, I'm living in a big city 
and I'm not learning from nature anymore. And if I'm going to teach children, I need to be learning about nature so that I can share it. So that's what happened. And in the beginning, it was all about the orca and trying to make sure people understood how we're connected to the orca, the mistakes that we've made about orca, that they're in trouble, the things that we can do every day that make it better for the orca because that's better for us. But then the humpback started coming back. And it just wasn't okay to go, hey, look, it's a humpback. It's like, who is it? Where did they come from? Are they going to come back? How old are they? Is it a boy or a girl? And that started all of this. So it's curiosity. And then I also started diving. And then I learned how powerful it is to take the pictures. Because otherwise, people just think about the whales and the big fish they take out of the ocean. And they don't understand how things are connected. So that's what led to this. And a lot of it is volunteer. Like, I found my own way to do it. And yeah, that's how it happened is curiosity and really listening to my heart too, that when I was really happy and learning things, I thought that's it. I know that I'm on the right path. I uh, you I love this individual approach for wildlife, thinking of as individuals rather than a collective. Uh, British Columbia in general seems to do this better than almost anywhere else that we feature broadcasts from around the world. Uh, we have OceanWise a lot, the Vancouver Aquarium, and they know all the individual orcas, the resident killer whales there by name. You're talking about this with humpbacks too. And it's something that I think if anyone pioneered it, it would have been Jane Goodall doing chimpanzee research and really yeah. focusing on the names because before that people said, oh, let's give them a number or don't, don't care at all. And, and her approach was very different and it changed the way biological research is done around the world. And I think that's been a really big benefit for, for wildlife on this planet and for people's connection with it. So I'm really glad you got a chance to mention that. Um, also, something I've been trying to make sure I slip into every broadcast. You obviously have such joy scuba diving. You have these amazing images that we have of you at the beginning with the, the scuba gear. And I want to stress for all our students, at eight years old, you can start on the path to being a scuba diver. Uh, PADI, which is a certification organization, has the Bubble Maker program where you learn and get on the path to being a scuba diver. I got my certification two years ago. It's one of the best things I've ever done. You literally open up 70% of this planet to your explorations. So really consider that. It's an amazing thing that I think a lot of our students today are of age that can do that. So consider that going forward. Um, I want to come back to our live classes for another round in just a minute, Jackie, but I want to take a few quick ones from YouTube. Uh, Mr. McCleary has been joining us for tons of broadcasts this year, and he wants to know, what's the biggest whale you've ever seen in Canadian waters? <laughs> hey, it's the biggest whale that has ever existed. In fact, the biggest animal that has ever existed, and that is the blue whale. So it makes sense, the blue whale, 30 meters, that it's the biggest animal that ever lived because it's being held up by the ocean. There's no way that land animals can be as big because they can't carry their weight on their limbs. So I've seen that in central Canada, but also I'm very, very lucky that I get to do trips way, way far away from British Columbia's coast. And it's amazing, even though we whaled them, there's still blue whales out there and right whales out there and sperm whales out there. And they're the survivors. And to think about that is really powerful. Yeah, you guys, uh, sorry, I'm bringing this up just because it's one of the best videos you'll ever see on YouTube ever. If you look up David Attenborough, Blue Whale, when he first sees them for the first time, it's one of my favorite natural history moments ever. They are, they're the biggest animal ever to exist. Their heart's the size of a car, their tongue's the size of an elephant. I mean, these are just massive, incredible animals. Um, blue whales are just the best. If you guys aren't on the blue whale train, you should be by the end of this broadcast. Um, I was looking to the side there, but so many comments have come in, it's hard to find questions, which is great. Um, so Miss uh, Donnelly's class, Hannah wants to know, why don't turtles get stung when they're eating those jellyfish? I knew we'd get this. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good question because it makes, it makes very clear that you're thinking along those connections. So yeah. it's the way that their mouths are formed. And like, there's even things like a lot of people know that there's clownfish with anemones in the tropics. We have yeah. that in BC waters too, that there's anemones and then there's fish who live under them who then nature's way is this is where you get to live and protect yourself you won't be stung and if you get a chance like we have a whole leatherbacks in bc website and if you look hannah and that wet uh, on that website you'll see that so the whole inside of the mouth of the turtle is even designed with spikes so that it the jelly can't slip out and to realize things like that in nature like whoa that's why that fish has a head like that. That's why there's that in the mouth of the leatherback turtle. And another species that doesn't get stung by animals with stinging cells are a lot of those sea slugs, the nudibranchs. They actually take in the stinging cells and they make them their weapons to protect themselves because they're a soft-bodied animal without a shell. 
Like it's incredible how this is connected. And if you learn to look like that, and it doesn't just have to be about the ocean. Yeah, you learn to look at like that, birds and other animals on land, you begin to realize, I don't have to read all these things. If I can figure it out myself, because everything is the way it is for a reason. Yeah. Uh, flamingos mouths and how they filter salt is one of the coolest things in nature, which I only found out about a few years ago. And I'm so glad you brought up the new brain thing. So imagine this. Imagine if you were like a hunter and you you uh, attack something that's much bigger and has claws and big scary teeth or whatever, or wings, and then you suddenly could like absorb those wings or claws or teeth. This is what the nudibranchs do when they attack these jellyfish. They can literally like utilize their stinging cells. It's one of the coolest things in nature. We talked about this in our program earlier today at 11 Eastern uh, with Monica and Jennifer and some other cool creatures that like put on the skin of the other creatures around them to make a home. Like it's really freaky stuff. Very, very cool. So, so glad we got a chance to bring that up. Time flies and you're having fun. So we've got time for our three more questions. I want to go to Miss Doll's class first. If you guys want to come back in, go for it. <laughs> Hi, Jackie, you are so passionate. I love your passion. It's uh, inspiring. Um, can you give us a few examples of um, water animals that you feel are misunderstood? Oh, goodness. What a, what a really, really good question. So, and it's a, it's a real problem that we decide animals are supposed to be a certain way. Like dolphins are supposed to be playful and there's, and otters are supposed to be cute. And oh, those killer whales that eat seals and sea lions, they're bad and they play with their food. So almost everything, those are just the mammals where we should be able to identify with them more because they're mammals. But even we decide they're supposed to be a certain way and that doesn't work. They, I love thinking, always like there is no good in nature there is no bad in nature there's just wild so sea otters do things that we don't expect them to do orca some of them are really important predators like sharks they're going to do what they have to do and then of course the animals that don't have fur or eyes in the same sort of way we do they're completely misunderstood and so much like i'd actually have a really big answer which is so much that's hidden in our dark water that we need to care about because we live in Canada, is we have our attention pointed to life far, far away, like seahorses and other kinds of trolls, where we need to go, no, as of today, I know that cold water has even more life in it, and I'm going to learn about that, and I'm going to care about that, because that's closer to home. I'm, it's a, a beautiful answer, and I think it's something that you've you've harped on more than almost anyone on our other broadcast, not just this Ocean's Week, but in general, is that we have so much diversity, so much life on our coast. Uh, we talked in our first broadcast during this week about the Great Lakes, too, and the ecosystems that are there, and I think, you know, Canadians, when I was a kid, if I thought of biodiversity in the world, I thought of Australia, I thought of the Amazon mm -hmm. rainforest, I thought of the Serengeti, and those are magical, amazing places. Everyone should get the chance to see those in their lives. They're unbelievable. But off our shores, we have one of the we have the second largest country in the world. We have the most coastline in the world, and we have just the most magical places. We had Jill Heinerthon to begin this week. She has dove all over the world, and when she's been asked in the past what her favorite place to dive is on Earth, it's Race Rocks off BC. It's off the coast in British Columbia because of that profusion of life. And so I hope you know many of our Canadian kids today and, and kids in the United States as well get the chance to think of our coast right off our shores as being really, really special, unique places worthy of protection. So. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, let's head to Mr. Fulber's class and Chalker, if you want to unmute your mic, you're good to go for a second question and we'll wrap up in Missouri in a minute. Hey, Mr. Fulber. All right, one more question came in. Uh, bird bricks, do they have any use that people can use them for? Uh, absolutely, well, not that people can use it for. So I, I, I really understand the question because very often it's like, hmm, we humans, can we use it? We don't have to use everything directly, but in nature, there's absolutely no waste. There's no waste. So those bird bricks and everything that's in their bodies from the richness of the ocean, that ends up going back into the ocean. So there is no waste at all. And again, if the ocean's okay, we've got an indirect benefit because of the food, because of the oxygen, because of the carbon dioxide being taken in, and because there's something just really big and special about the ocean. Yeah. I'm so glad we got a question on bird bricks. What a fascinating story. And, and thank you for highlighting that during your talk, too. So, Mr. Fulber, thanks for the question. Um, Ms. Dillon, let's wrap up in Missouri, heading down to the U.S. Come on in and take us away, guys. Hi, my name is Fiona. And my name is 
Sorry, ladies. Sorry, there's some sort of other device there. So let's turn off the other device. But I am I understanding. I can hear you. Okay. So I think what you're asking is, even though you live really, really far away from the ocean, what can you do to make it better for the ocean? Yeah. Is that the? And what can we do to change the plastic problem and not hurt animals? And what animal likes eating plastic? Yeah. No animal likes eating plastic. Plastic does not belong in nature at all. Yeah, so, and plastic at any size is a problem. So even if it gets eaten like in big amounts like that, but if it stays in the ocean, it will break down. It won't decay. The sunlight will break it down into tiny pieces and then it becomes part of the food web. And that's just not good. And those tiny pieces also attract toxins, which aren't good either. So no animal likes eating plastic. And it's an example, wonderful students, of just how easy it is, like when you care to make a difference, because what's with all the plastic? Yeah, if we think about it, like, you know, oh my goodness, it is an impossible problem in the world. There are plastic water bottles. What will we do? I don't know, maybe not use plastic water bottles. Yeah, and we don't have to be perfect. So sometimes plastic bags, sometimes disposables, but if we care enough, like it's also easy to make biodegradable plastic. Yeah. So really, if you being far away from the ocean, dear students, you're not actually far away from the ocean. I know what you're saying, but what we do with energy use, anything that makes the planet warmer, anything we do with bad chemicals and that we're not thinking about what goes down the drains, anything that we do with creating a lot of throwaway things, buying lots of things, these are simple things. It's actually the most valuable thing I can share with you is to realize that when we use less, it's actually about more. It's not about loss and I don't get to do things. It's like, no, I get to save money. I get to make a difference. I get to think of new ways of doing things. Less is more. Consume less, care more. We've had two messages uh, over the course of this Oceans Week that have been really special. One you ended your broadcast with, which is don't waste in general, seems to be the essence of all climate habitat preservation, conservation. If we think about the choices we make when we buy things or when we don't buy things, it can make a huge positive difference. And refuse. Uh, people talked about the three R's, and I think a lot of our students, I grew up with the three R's as a kid, and there have been additions to that, but one of the big ones is refuse. If you go to a grocery store and they offer you a plastic bag, bring an alternative. So you can say, no, I don't want that. You go to a restaurant and they offer you a straw, bring your own. Bring things where you don't have to utilize these resources, and it can make a really, really big positive difference. Um, another quick note, just in case kids are looking or teachers are looking for great education resources, National Geographic has their Planet or Plastic Initiative with tons of resources around this. They've dedicated major articles to this, stories, programs for kids. It's a fantastic series. Uh, and OceanWise, the Vancouver Aquarium, their education programs on plastic are top notch. So if you want to find out even more ways you guys can take action as a classroom, uh, those are some great resources. The Shoreline Cleanup in Canada, shorelinecleanup.ca, is an amazing program. So you can help contribute to citizens science you can help clean up those beaches clean up local areas near you whether you're on an ocean or not um some really really tough that stuff and i, I want to before I, oh go ahead and, go ahead. and please follow the marine education and research society and the marine detective because we too have an anti-plastics program that will be launched uh, very soon dealing with problems like how plastic ends up around the necks of sea lions and that we're not doing anything about it and also like on the marine detective Every Friday I do a Find the Fish Friday, where it's like, where's Waldo? And you try to find the fish, but then what your brain is picking up on is, wait a minute, she's showing us what it looks like in this ocean. Yeah, nice, I'm gonna check it out. So please do send it our way. We'll make sure all the classes get it after the fact. Um, Jackie, this has been such a special program. We've gotten almost more comments about how incredible this is and how incredible you are than any broadcast this month. So really appreciate the support, the enthusiasm, and the, the passion. It's been so special. Um, for any one of our students that want to check out more on, on Jackie, more on some great programs throughout the rest of the week, oceanweekcan.ca is the Ocean Week one-stop shop for all the programs past, present, and, and future tomorrow to wrap up the week. Um, so I really hope you guys get the chance to check it out. And Jackie, uh, what we do at the end of every broadcast, it's your first time with us, we're gonna bring in our teachers. So Miss Dahl, Mr. Fulmer, and Miss Dylan, and your whole class, if you guys could join me in being as enthusiastic as I am and saying a quick thank you and goodbye, have a wonderful